conflicts of interest not relevant to this talk. Well, <clears throat> how patients will be ventilated from now in 10 years, I don't know. We should ask uh, these guys, we should have a time machine to go there, take a look and, and come back. But based on what is coming out on the literature, I think I could <clears throat> give you my personal guess, which probably uh, might be wrong. So how will we deal with the number of, of parameters which we currently set? How will we deal for tidal volume? It's been now 16 years since publication of these uh, studies, and I think if ARES.net got one cent for every time this slide was shown, they would be able to run trials for the next uh, 20 years. But anyway, uh, still our uh, current uh, setting of tidal volume is um, six uh, milliliters per kilo predicted body weight. However, there is a very important uh, thing we need to keep in mind with ARDS. Uh, this is a slide I borrowed from Antonio Pesenti. And we have to consider the fact that while in a, <coughs> sorry, in a normal uh, subject, we patient, we have an end expiratory lung volume of some two and a half liters and a minute ventilation less than seven, which makes a ratio between the two uh, of 2.5. In ARDS lungs, in ARDS patients, we, we have much smaller lungs, okay, with a reduced end expiratory lung volume and uh, impressively higher minute ventilation. We said there 15, which is perhaps on the uh, high side, but still you have an increased uh, minute ventilation because of dead space. And so to make a long story short, uh, the ratio between the ventilation and the room available for this ventilation to occur is much, much higher. This famous baby lung is working and working hard. And is this important? It is because... <coughs> Excuse me. There are a number of, of studies that do show that the ratio of tidal volume over uh, the, the room available for ventilation, which in this case was FRC, is a determinant of injury. This is a study published by the group of, of uh, Gattinoni <coughs> that, this, that showed that uh, uh, when strain, so the ratio of tidal volume on FRC exceeds a number of two, uh, this will cause lung injury as we see by the development of edema. Whereas if this ratio is kept below a given threshold, this lung injury does not occur. These are healthy pigs ventilated for 48 hours and they had to use very, very high uh, tidal volumes to produce this kind of strain. So you might ask the question, okay, but is this clinically relevant? More or less at the same time, we were studying lung inflammation by positron emission tomography, which uh, tracks metabolic metabolically active cells, and so it does track inflammatory cells. And we measure the inflammation of the baby lung. And we also, uh, here on the right-hand side, and on the left, by CT scan, we measure the deformation of the baby lung. We had end expiratory and end inspiratory CT scan, and we were able to measure the regional tidal volume by CT scan, normalized by end expiratory lung volume, again by CT scan, which is sort of a measurement of strain. And again, look here on the right, for the sake of time, I don't go into all the details, that if, you, if this ratio, the ratio between tidal volume and the volume available for ventilation to occur becomes high, then the lung become more, the lungs become more and more inflamed. So this is another evidence that tidal volume, not over ideal predicted body weight, but over the size of the volume is, could be a determinant of ventilator-induced lung injury or uh, lung inflammation. 
And again, it was nice to see that by a totally different technique, a totally different group, totally different approach, still these results were replicated by this interesting study done in Spain where they have divided patients based on the level of strain below 20, uh, 0.27 or above 0.27. And again, they have, showed that, have shown that if the strain is higher than a given level, this will cause an increase in the inflammatory cytokines. So <clears throat> what I think we uh, could be next in the future is that if now we, uh, sorry for the title of the slide, um, if we now in the present scale tidal volume on body weight, on predicted body weight, which is basically height, in the future, maybe, hopefully, we might be able to scale tidal volume on end expiratory lung volume, uh, provided we are able to measure it. How do we deal with plateau pressure? We all know that, and you've heard plateau pressure in this room over these two days many and many times, and I think it's, uh, it's worth uh, keeping mentioning it because plateau pressure is a key point in uh, monitoring and managing our patients. Plateau pressure has a steep linear correlation with uh, mortality and plateau pressure should, uh, when possible, be kept below 20 seven, 30 centimeters of water. So I think plateau pressure still remains our benchmark, if you will, our, uh, one of our beacons when we are ventilating our patients. Still, the LungSafe study, which we published, and this was something that was alluded to uh, by Professor Kahn before, shows that we are pretty good at keeping our plateau pressure in a safe range, which is good, but we not that often measure plateau pressure. Like in this series, we found that plateau pressure was recorded on day one only in 40% of patients with severe ARDS. And if we restrict our analysis to patients with controlled ventilation, so those patients in whom for sure, measuring plateau pressure was feasible, still we don't go above 50%. So I think uh, we are learning how plateau pressure is important and it would be important if every patient has plateau pressure measured once a day or every time we change ventilatory setting. But as I, as I said, and again, this is a study which has been quoted, even if a plateau pressure uh, remains there, and, and, and I'm not suggesting by any means that we should not look at plateau pressure anymore, there is more coming to the field. One of these is uh, driving pressure, which is just a way of scaling tidal volume on compliance under the assumption that somehow compliance resembles end expiratory lung volume. And so if we scale tidal volume on compliance, it is similar to scaling tidal volume on uh, end expiratory lung volume. And basically, if we divide tidal volume by compliance, we get driving pressure. This was introduced by Marcelo Amato in the New England Journal of Medicine. And uh, this work was shown already. If you look, for example, at, at this uh, quartile on your, um, uh, sorry, at this uh, um, graph on your um, right-hand side, you will see that even if your driving pressure is the same, uh, sorry, if your uh, plateau pressure is the same within a safe range, this can be achieved by a different combination of low PEEP and high driving pressure or high PEEP and low driving pressure. And these different combinations are associated with very different mortalities. If you have 28 plateau pressure, but low PEEP and uh, high driving pressure, your patient is gonna die more likely than if you have a high PEEP and the low driving pressure. 
So I think this study suggests the importance of driving pressure. It was shown already that we found this association with outcome in lung safe, and there is a paper which was just accepted on ICM and will be published soon, uh, which is a secondary analysis on the lung safe study, which shows again that driving pressure is an independent predictor of mortality. And I think this is a strong message because we had a completely different cohort. These are patients uh, randomized in controlled clinical trials. We an analyzed retrospectively. We prospectively enrolled patients in an observational study. So completely different settings, but still the same message. Another thing which was mentioned uh, by Claude uh, for the future is the increasing interest in the monitoring of esophageal pressure. I brought here two <laughs> review articles that uh, uh, you might want to um, read and, uh, uh, and, and perhaps uh, share with your colleagues uh, because I think uh, they are very clear, they are very well written. Uh, Joran Edenstierna did by himself uh, the work that uh, all these people, including myself, have done. So, <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, plateau, um, transpulmonary pressure uh, is uh, increasing, and one of the reasons is this very interesting study by Danny Talmor, published in the New England almost 10 years ago now. Uh, it's a study that, that for sure has some limitation, like everything, and it's very easy to criticize uh, somebody's work after this has been done, but I think it deserves the, the merit of having re-engaged um, the, the focus on esophageal uh, pressure. I'm not going into the details because uh, this, uh, there is a um, talk on that, but I think whether you measure absolute values like uh, uh, Danny Talmor did or deltas like uh, uh, Cumello and Gattinoni suggested, uh, the, the use of esophageal pressure can provide added value. So if uh, in the present we have plateau pressure, I think plateau pressure will stay, should stay, but perhaps in the future we will see more about transpulmonary pressure and driving pressure. How about another very hot uh, topic, which is PEEP setting? How do you uh, set PEEP? Who is using uh, ARDS network or whatever kind of tables? Raise your hands. Don't be shy. Okay. Who is using oxygenation? Who is using compliance? Okay. So quite a mixture. And so I think <clears throat> a lot of things, many, many papers have been written uh, on, on this topic. I, I always start from this point. It's a meta-analysis from Briel uh, summarizing a bunch of uh, studies on uh, uh, PEEP setting. And again, meta-analysis have all their limitation. Uh, they mix apple and oranges, blah, 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 blah. But still, we have... Uh, two, uh, more than 2,000 patients analyzed. So I think there is a message, there is a value in this that we should consider. And what this meta-analysis showed is that even if we mix together studies that used completely different approach to set uh, PEEP, like the LOVE study, EXPRESS trial, and, and so forth, patients that at that time were called with ARDS, now we would call them moderate and severe patients. And these were patients with uh, ALI only, so that we would call um, mild ARDS. In these patients, higher PEEP was more protective uh, in terms of, of mortality than a lower PEEP, when higher and lower PEEP have this uh, meaning. However, I think we are more and more learning that it's not just uh, the, the way we should set PEEP, should not just take into account the patient condition at baseline when we assess the patient the first time, and I think this uh, was nicely shown by, by Claude, but the response to PEEP. This is a very smart and elegant uh, uh, study. 
performed by uh, Ewan Golliger in, in Toronto. Again, it's a, it's a secondary analysis of other studies, but basically what he has shown is that take this uh, purple line. This purple line refers to patients in whom following a PEEP trial, PEEP was increased, okay? And then here he plotted the uh, probability of that as a function of the PF change following initial PEEP change. So if you're here, it means that your PEEP was increased and your PF ratio increased by 200 millimeters of mercury. And as you see, responders to PEEP died much less than patients who did not respond to PEEP. Whereas this was not the case for decreasing uh, levels of PEEP. So the message of this slide, I'm, I'm sorry if I was not very clear in my explanation, is that perhaps more than looking at the PF ratio when we set PEEP, we should also take into account what happens to the PF ratio after we set PEEP. Because if PF ratio drops, this means we haven't done a good job. If PF ratio goes up, we perhaps have done a good job. But for those of you who like compliance better, we can also have an example with uh, compliance where <coughs> we just take a look at how compliance reacts to our PEEP change. And again, if tidal volume is the same, looking at compliance and looking at driving pressure does not really matter. The numbers are different, but, but the message is exactly the same if tidal volume is constant. So we have this guy here on zero PEEP. So by definition, he cannot have RDS, but anyway, <laughs> on zero PEEP, 18 centimeters of water plateau pressure. We increase PEEP by eight centimeters of water, but plateau pressure increases only by six centimeters of water. What does this mean? It means that driving pressure has gone down, or like we would say two years ago, that compliance went up. I think this is an important and positive message that our PEEP has achieved, likely, some recruitment. Then we all know that there is always recruitment and over distension going on at the same time, but <clears throat> looking what happens to plateau pressure after a PEEP change is a strong readout of the effect of PEEP on mechanical properties <coughs> of respiratory system. But more important than this, I am very, very scared at the bedside when I see this happen. When I raise PEEP by two centimeters of water and I see plateau pressure going up by four centimeters of water. This means that at this stage, we are over distending the lung because again, driving pressure went up or compliance went down. So somehow we reach the point that we do not want to go above. And so in this case, I think this is an important message again of a level of plateau pressure that, that should not be uh, passed. <clears throat> I'll skip this, uh, the details for the sake of time, but again, if we were able to have a bedside, and, and it was actually explained already by, by Geren, but just to, to mention that if we would have a bedside tool to measure end expiratory lung volume, this could also be used to study recruitment following a recruitment maneuver, a PEEP change, prone positioning, and, and so it would be an important tool that we would have to analyze the, uh, the mechanical properties of the uh, respiratory system of our patients. And finally, I, and there was a question on, on, on this before, I think the uh, role of non-invasive bedside techniques uh, is emerging. Some people suggest that we could use ultrasounds, which I think it's, uh, it's a very interesting tool. I just brought you an example of what we could do with uh, electrical impedance tomography. Here we have our patient. This is all these uh, black lines represents tidal volume, and this is the um, volume of the lungs derived from the electrical impedance tomography, just global volume, not regional information. And here we give the patient a recruitment maneuver. 
here. And we see that even if we do not change PEEP, the end expiratory lung volume goes up. So this suggests that we have achieved some recruitment. And if we set just the line here, we will see that over time, our PEEP is not sufficient to keep the alveoli open. We are progressively losing and losing and losing alveoli. You see, and the expiratory lung volume is drifting down and down and down. And so what shall we do? Again, we perform another recruitment maneuver. We increase PEEP by two centimeters of water. And at this stage, this PEEP increase is enough to keep the lung recruited. So I think if the present is the use of higher PEEP in uh, uh, moderate severe, or the present is tables, oxygenation, compliance, I think in the future, I hope there will be more individualized uh, uh, PEEP setting based on individual patient response. And, and then the field is open to what is best to look at, perhaps a combination of two or three parameters, oxygenation and compliance, uh, EIT, and I mean, th there's, there's a lot of, of things, and I'm not sure that, that we should have all the same approach. What I'm quite convinced of, though, is that titrating PEEP on the individual response, it's very important. And finally, I, I would like to briefly mention how we should deal with spontaneous breathing of our patients. We have seen by, um, shown from, uh, from Claude, the very important trial by Laurent Papazian on the use of neuromuscular blocking agents in severe ARDS. How do we deal with spontaneous breathing? I think spontaneous breathing, it's not either good or bad per se. I think it has a bright side. It has many, many positive things. We can sedate the patient less. We reduce muscle atrophy, improve hemodynamics. We have a better VQ matching. But there is a dark side, which we have to keep in mind. And we lose, almost lose control, or we might lose control on tidal volume, or we have less control on tidal volume. We have high inspiratory pressure. We heard that yesterday from, from uh, Antonio Pesenti. You don't see them on the ventilator screen, but the lungs will see them. You have the risk of asynchronies, you have increased oxygen consumption. And to make a long story short, I always show this slide by, you know, of a paper that by Takeshi Yoshida, which shows a very, very important message, which is if you have a mild injury, these are animals, it's what I would call a proof of concept study, but I think it's a very powerful study, which shows that if in animals you have a mild lung injury, and on top of this you allow the animals to breathe, <coughs> this will improve their, uh, the condition of their lungs, you see? But if you already start from a more severe lung injury and you allow the animal to breathe, this would make the lungs even worse. That's why uh, in an editorial we wrote on uh, current opinion, we uh, tried to summarize the ideas that breathing effort, as I said, spontaneous breathing from the patients is not either good or bad per se. Uh, it's a double-edged sword. And it's important to have a, a monitoring of what the patient is doing. We know, we all know that esophageal pressure is our, again, is our beacon, it's our benchmark. It's, uh, it's the standard that, that shows definitely what the patient is doing, but there are other less invasive and I would say even um, less cumbersome techniques to use, such as electrical activity of the diaphragm, for example, or even something easier, such as PO1 and, and things like that, which we will see during the hands-on sessions. So what do we do with spontaneous breathing at the present? I think I, I could not summarize what we do because I think we all do in a different way, more or less. But I think in the future, I hope in the future, there will be again, for each patient, a right timing and the right dose for spontaneous breathing. 
So to conclude, how will be ARDS patients? How will patients with ARDS be ventilated into that? Whatever. Tidal volume maybe could be scaled on end expiratory lung volume. Plateau pressure will stay. All these but goodies. But perhaps we will be able to add, not in all patients, not in all cases, but in, in many cases, driving pressure and transpulmonary pressure. PEEP set, hopefully according to a physiological response to PEEP, and spontaneous breathing at the right time and with the right dose. And I think that uh, Doc will uh, agree with me. Thanks a lot for your attention. <clears throat> Thank you so much, uh, Giacomo, for this very nice talk. <laughs> Any questions from the, from the floor? Antonio? I know it's not exactly mechanical ventilation, but what do you think of that one? Hmm. An echo. An echo. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I think, again, uh, that's, a, that's, an easy, that's an easy question uh, to, to answer because I can uh, say what, <laughs> <laughs> what Alain just said. No, I think there's, there's the nice thing about ECMO is that uh, uh, there's a, there are trials running, and so we are learning more and more. I, I think ECMO, with the improved technology and with our knowledge, has regained a, a very crucial role in, uh, in the management of, of mechanical ventilation as a rescue strategy. And I think in that the evidence is already there. Uh, the, I, I think the success of ECMO will also depend from, from what Alan mentioned, the, the ability of keeping ECMO capabilities in a few centers that do a lot of cases that centralize the patient. Because I think an easy way for killing ECMO would be like to give it away to all hospitals. And, and that would be, I think, a disaster. For ECOR, I think personally that there is, if I look at the LungSafe study, there is already a huge margin to ECOR in terms of uh, um, eliminating CO2 to go to an ultra-protective ventilation. There is already uh, some margin there to improve what we are doing. Uh, average respiratory rate in lung safe is 20, and average PCO2 is 42, 43. So I think these patients, even without ECOR, could be easily ventilated less. So I, mm -hmm. I'm not sure whether ECOR is something that uh, may, maybe along with ECOR, we should try to decrease uh, traditional ventilation anyway. So that would be my short answer. It's funny to be asked the question by the person who teach you everything, but anyway. <laughs> <coughs> okay.